Sweden Saab just injected some of its legendary Gripen DNA into the U.S. Air Force's new jet trainer. If you join the U.S. Air Force to fly fighters today, there's a good chance your first supersonic experience would still happen inside of a T-38 Talon, a jet that first rolled out when Kennedy was president. And the movie Top Gun wasn't even a concept in Don Simpson and Jerry Bruckheimer's brains. It's an icon, sure, but so is the rotary phone. That's why the Air Force is replacing it with something that looks and thinks like the aircraft of tomorrow, the T-7 Red Hawk, a sleek, digital, fifth-generation ready trainer co-developed by Boeing and Saab, a machine that's as smart as it is fast. And yes, the red tail isn't a fashion choice. It's a salute to the legendary Tuskegee Airmen, who proved that skill matters more than skin color or odds. So how did an American defense giant and a Swedish design house known for making jets that land on highways end up reinventing how the Air Force trains its pilots? Let's find out. Hey everyone, Wes here, military veteran, defense wonk, and for decades, the U.S. Air Force's jet training came down to the venerable Northrop T-38 Talon. When I was stationed at Shepard Air Force Base in Wichita Falls, Texas, probably the only hellscape more desolate than Brisbane, Australia, I was in training to maintain the radar system of the E-3 Sentry, and while there, these talons filled the sky all day and all night. Imagine just hearing jets doing jet stuff 24 hours a day, while those zoomies learned how to fly. For more than six decades, the T-38 Talon trained every fighter and bomber pilot in the U.S. Air Force. It taught generations to fly fast and think faster, yet as combat aircraft evolved from analog gauges to glass cockpits, the Talon stayed frozen in time. That mismatch turned into a training gap. Pilots were graduating from a jet designed in the age of slide rules and stepping into machines designed with supercomputers. They weren't learning the mental side of modern air combat. Sensor fusion, data management, split-second decision-making, they were learning to fly well but not to fly digitally. The Air Force knew the problem. It needed a bridge between eras, something built for the pilots who would fly the F-35s, the B-21s, and the drones yet to be named. That bridge became the T-7 Red Hawk. Now, the T-38 is a legend, but it's also an antique. Its analog dials, narrow frame, and 1960s design limit how far it can mimic the flight profiles of fifth-generation fighters. Instructors often had to improvise, explaining advanced radar tactics on a whiteboard after landing because the aircraft itself couldn't simulate them. The Talon could break the sound barrier, but it couldn't teach pilots how to fight inside of an information network. That created a cascade of issues in the Air Force. Maintenance became expensive as parts aged out of existence. Every hour in the air risked another airframe needing reinforcement. The Air Force could have modernized it, retrofit some digital displays, maybe upgrade the engine, but... That's like trying to turn a classic Mustang into a Tesla. It might run, but it's still thinking carburetors, not code. So the Pentagon greenlit a competition for a brand new advanced trainer. Boeing and Saab won in 2018 with a design that redefined how trainers should be built. Boeing could have gone solo, but they wanted agility. Literally and metaphorically, they found it in Saab, the Swedish defense firm behind the Gripen, a fighter so cost-effective and lethal that bigger nations quietly pretend not to be jealous. Saab brought a design philosophy the Pentagon sorely needed. Build light, build smart, and build digitally. While Boeing handled the final assembly and U.S. systems integration, Saab took on the aft fuselage, the hydraulics, and the flight control architecture, all modeled entirely in 3D. In traditional aircraft manufacturing, parts don't fit until you hammer them into submission. In the T-7 program, when Saab shipped its first fuselage section to St. Louis, engineers joined it with Boeing's front half in less than 30 minutes. No shims, no drama. It was digital precision turned into aerospace poetry. That efficiency was the payoff of designing the entire jet inside of a virtual ecosystem in Sweden, where every rivet, every circuit, and every cable already existed in software. The T-7A is the Air Force's first fully born digital aircraft. Every system from avionics to hydraulics lives inside a digital twin. 
a virtual model that mirrors the real jets every nut and bite. That means engineers can test upgrades in cyberspace before touching the hardware. They can simulate how a new radar or a weapon system would interact with the aircraft months before production. The result is fewer surprises, faster maintenance, and costs that don't require a congressional hearing to explain. The software backbone also means flexibility. Update the code, and it can mimic different fighters. Swap modules, and it could evolve into a light attack jet or even a drone controller. Digital birth came with challenges, though. It forced the Air Force to adopt new procurement models, to think like a software company instead of a bureaucracy. As you can imagine, that transition was bumpy but necessary. You can't train tomorrow's pilots on yesterday's paperwork. When you step into the old T-38, you see gauges that belong in a museum. Step into the T-7, and you're greeted by two large, multifunction displays, an all-digital HUD, and touchscreen interfaces that can reconfigure on the fly. It's about managing the information. Students train on live virtual constructive systems, meaning simulated enemies can appear inside the cockpit sensors even if the sky outside is empty. That creates a continuous feedback loop. Detect, decide, act, and reassess the mental cadence of modern combat. The T-7's embedded training systems lets instructors inject surface-to-air threats, jamming scenarios, and allied data links mid-mission. In the old T-38, you learned aerodynamics. In the T-7, you learned decision dominance. And because this is still a jet, not a simulator, mistakes have consequences. The instructors sit higher in stadium seating, monitoring every move. The ejection system is next generation also, designed with digital sensors that analyze pilot size, pilot weight, and the speed to deploy safely. But what about that red tail legacy? Well, when the Air Force unveiled the T-7's red tail, it was pure symbolism. The Red Hawk name honors the Tuskegee Airmen, America's first black military aviators who fought both fascism abroad and racism at home. Their P-51 Mustangs carried bright red tails that struck fear into German pilots and pride into everyone who served beside them. The Air Force wanted the next generation of pilots to inherit that same sense of purpose, courage, innovation, and unyielding excellence. Painting the T-7's tail red links the past to the future, the analog heroes of the 1940s inspiring the digital warriors of the 2040s. It's a reminder that technology may evolve, but the core mission never changes. Protect, defend, and never stop improving. Now, I spoke with three U.S. Air Force F-35 fighter pilots for this video, and the Air Force's traditional training path was always straightforward, but kind of inefficient. T-6 Texan II for basics, T-38 for jets, and then straight into an operational aircraft. It worked, but it left huge skill gaps. Pilots learned physical flying long before they learned data management. The T-7 flips that sequence. Now, from day one of advanced training, students deal with information overload, radar returns, threat data, and networked communication. The embedded simulation environment means they can practice intercepting enemy fighters or coordinating with drones without ever loading live ordnance. That saves fuel, saves time, and saves money while providing a cognitive workout impossible in older aircraft. And it's not just faster either, it's smarter. By the time a trainee moves to an F-35 or a B-21, the systems feel familiar. The brain's already wired for the chaos of multi-domain warfare. It's that crucial muscle memory that's impossible to replicate in the old Talon. And when everything's digital, every training mission generates data, data instructors can analyze to refine curriculum, predict fatigue, and even tailor instruction to individual learning styles. Of course, this is still a military program, not a tech startup. The T-7's rollout did hit turbulence. Supply chain delays, software validation, bottlenecks, and cockpit vibration issues all slowed things down. Originally, the Air Force hoped to declare initial operational capability by 2025. Now, that slid closer to 2027. Test pilots have flown prototypes at Edwards Air Force Base, identifying fixes and refining handling qualities. Delays aren't fun, but they've yielded results. The refined flight control system is smoother, the software is more stable, 
and maintainers are already writing new digital workflows to support the jet. Meanwhile, Boeing and Saab have ramped up production infrastructure. A facility in Indiana for fuselages, St. Louis for final assembly. So when the green light comes, jets can roll off the line quickly. Now the Air Force has already received several early production aircraft to train the instructors and the maintenance crews. The goal is to have the 14th Flying Training Wing at Columbus Air Force Base fully equipped by late 2027. In other words, the countdown's delayed, but the rocket's still on the pad. Replacing the trainer might not sound glamorous compared to stealth bombers or hypersonic missiles, but it's strategically vital. Every combat sortie begins with a pilot who once sat in a trainer. If the trainer fails, the whole ecosystem weakens. The T-7 modernizes that foundation. It produces pilots who already think in networks, who see information as a weapon. That cognitive leap means faster adaptation in real combat, fewer mistakes, better coordination, and greater survivability. It's also export gold. Nations flying US and NATO-aligned fighters want compatible trainers. Australia, Japan, and several European countries have already expressed interest. The more widespread the T-7 becomes, the more interoperable future allied air forces will be. So while it may not carry missiles, the T-7 quietly shapes the global balance of air power, one syllabus at a time. The T-38 trained pilots who flew over Hanoi, Baghdad, and Kosovo. It deserves respect. But let's be honest, most of today's recruits were born after the iPhone, and some of those talons still have switches labeled tape. The T-7, on the other hand, is like giving those same recruits an F-35 on training wheels. It's easier, it's faster, it's smarter, and less likely to make you wonder if your oxygen system's older than your instructor. Of course, the new jet will have its own quirks, digital systems crash, sensors misbehave, but unlike my Windows 11 laptop, the T-7 has an ejection seat which is the ultimate reboot button. Okay, thanks for watching, friends. If you enjoyed this dive into the future of air power, hit that subscribe button and join me for more stories about how technology, tactics, and a little common sense are reshaping modern warfare. And as always, glory to Ukraine, glory to the heroes. Crimea is Ukraine.